we'll do more asymmetry today about the papers you've read. So hopefully, we'll have some good discussion since you read the papers already. But how are these papers? Say it again. Did you finish all these reviews? Everyone? This was last Friday, if you remember last Friday. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed them. We'll cover uh, this after we finish asymmetry. We'll go to uh, multi-threading after this. Hopefully after this lecture. Maybe even in this lecture if we have time. Okay. Did you guys enjoy these papers? Yeah? OK. I guess I'll look over your reviews. And when we discuss some of these papers, hopefully you'll have more comments. And you know that your project proposal is due. Is this Tuesday, really? OK, Tuesday, tomorrow. Is everyone OK with that time? Or Yeah? I'm willing to stretch it if you're, <laughs> I don't want uh, proposals that are uh, nonsense, if you will. <laughs> I prefer proposals that are well thought about and well written, well described, rather than a random proposal. So I'm willing to give you more time if you need more time. If you don't need more time, stick to the deadline. That's perfectly fine. Who, who, who needs more time, you think? And don't be shy. Yeah. OK, I know that. We need to talk, actually. And we will. Who else? Nobody else? You need more time? OK. <laughs> so two, two groups, unless you guys are working together and decided to do that <laughs> in the last moment. <laughs> OK. Yeah, then we should talk. Uh, and I'm willing to stretch the deadline on this one. But if you have the proposal, don't stretch the deadline, because other deadlines will come. <laughs> Okay, And you know what the proposal is about. I've already given you this, but a very brief summary. What I'm looking for is a clear, insightful write-up that contains what's the problem you're trying to solve. Always start with that. Why is it important? It doesn't need to be pages and pages, of course. Uh, your goal, your solution idea, or your exploration idea. Remember, there were two types of research proposals that we discussed. One could be you have an idea and you have uh, you would like to use that idea to solve. The other is you don't have an idea yet, but you want to explore and figure out what the idea is. Both are fine. What have other done to solve the problem, which means related work, right? Uh, and why, ha why have they not solved the problem? What are the advantages and disadvantages of your solution idea compared to those? And your research and evaluation plan for the rest of the semester. If it's, is it three months? Two months? OK, so. And this includes, of course, clear goals of what, what you're planning to achieve by milestone one, milestone two, and final report. Okay. And a good goal in all of this is to actually advance the state of the art and uh, publish a top conference paper. ISCA would be a good conference, or MICRO would be a good conference. But you can explain everything you want to do in two, three pages covering all of this. OK? And since you like the <laughs> last set of papers, there are more papers. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll enjoy these also. Some of these are short. Actually, the first one is uh, one, a one-page paper related to what you guys have been reading or thinking about. Uh, there's a presentation also, but it's a one-page position write-up that I did uh, for NSF this year, or for, for an NSF workshop. Uh, so it won't be a research paper, but it's more of a research direction paper. And hopefully you'll empathize with a lot of the things that, that are talked about in that. Uh, so that should be easy to review. Uh, the other is, uh, I will very briefly cover it today probably, but that's another application of identifying bottlenecks. If you identify limiter threads, what can you do in the memory scheduler to prioritize them? And then we'll go into caching sometime next week. Uh, so these are uh, the, some of the recent works in caching, also cutting edge works, actually, uh, that hopefully you'll enjoy. Well, I guess the next one is not caching. 
but we'll cover caching, memory, compression uh, in the first part of next week when, after we, we're done or we're partially done with multi-threading. Okay? Some of you may have read some of these papers, uh, actually maybe all of them. Because we've covered in 447, we've briefly covered, uh, I, I pointed you to the uh, technical report, right? I don't know if you read it, but some of you are doing projects related to that. So for those of you, it'll be easy. <laughs> okay. How is reviewing four papers? It's not <laughs> somebody is shaking their head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, how long, in your estimation, should it like take to review four papers? Well, it could take a long time. <laughs> you could actually spend as much as much time as it takes uh, to read a paper, but this is uh, partially to get you uh, accustomed to reading a lot of works. So, it's, if it takes long, that's okay. You're you're you're. You're fine if you eat, uh, it's okay even if you submit the reviews late. I think you will still benefit from submitting uh, the reviews, but it's okay. I'm, I'm happy to accept late reviews. These deadlines are just to uh, give you guidance. Okay. So late reviews will not be, uh, well, unless they're really late, <laughs> will not be frowned upon necessarily. I'd rather get to, uh, have you read the papers and get the ideas and they write up critical reviews based on what you read. So it could take, I don't know, five hours even <laughs> to read a paper, right? So you could imagine that this will be very long, yes? Um, is the first one there just like a single compressed page? It's a single page, yeah, that's right. It's a single page write up. Okay. So the first one is, a, is an easy one, hopefully. That's, that's to get you thinking. And maybe you'll incorporate some of those concepts in your research topics. Yes? So we're supposed to write a review as long as the paper? No, no. <laughs> I already talked about that, right? <laughs> Don't try to use as long as the paper. No, no, no. It's like the first paper is a page. Uh -huh. right? So the review is about the same way. Yeah, so review can be uh, that way, yeah. Okay. I don't think it'll be as long as a paper because the paper is really compressed. But review is. Uh, Review length doesn't necessarily change based on the paper, right? This is to stimulate you and get uh, some ideas going in your head. Because it's, a, it's really a position paper. It does reference some of the papers you have read that or are going to read. So it puts some things together. OK? OK. So last lecture, Han covered. Uh, some emerging memory technologies. We will get back to main memory again. But you remember, right? And he covered heterogeneity in memory. We will continue with heterogeneity or asymmetry, which are the same thing uh, today. Any questions about the last lecture? Everybody was here and excited about the topic? It's an important topic. Uh, and we'll get back to main memory again. But today, we'll first cover more asymmetric multi-core, the readings that you've done. We'll go into more detail. Uh, we'll talk about stage execution, another reading uh, you've done. And we'll talk about uh, another use of asymmetry in memory scheduling. Uh, this I haven't assigned, but I'll cover it briefly. At some point, we may get back to it when we, when we get to main memory. But there are many applications of asymmetry. And uh, as you've listened to me last in, in the previous lecture, uh, that's one of the promising ways of building systems going into the future. Okay, now let's get back to it. This is kind of where we left uh, the outline at. We talked about accelerated critical sections, and we started talking about bottleneck identification and scheduling. In fact, I was in the middle of it when we ended the lecture, right? So we'll continue uh, on that path. Uh, Han covered the heterogeneous DRAM, uh, non-volatile memory, main memory. So we're, I'm not going to cover that. But I'm happy to take questions. So I'll jump over this quickly. You all remember bottlenecks, right? Different bottlenecks in parallel applications. And I encourage you to think of other bottlenecks that are not present here. So hopefully you're thinking about that. Because those could be very promising research opportunities. And we've covered the key insight, which is thread weighting reduces parallelism 
So why don't we somehow estimate, identify bottlenecks that, that cause a lot of thread weighting? Because it's likely that those bottlenecks will be on the critical path of execution. And that was the idea in bottleneck identification and scheduling. Somehow estimate these and accelerate them uh, with a powerful uh, large core. And you remember this slide. We've covered the compiler library programmer part where software somehow annotates what are potential bottlenecks and implements waiting for bottlenecks such that the hardware can use those annotations, those instructions uh, to measure how much thread weighting each bottleneck causes and based on that accelerate the bottleneck with the highest thread weighting cycles on a large core. Now you can think about other, uh, doing other things to the bottlenecks, but maybe we can talk about that. Okay, I'll, this is just to warm you up. You remember all of these code segments, right? This is how you would do the bottleneck weighting and bottleneck identification. Uh, software would mark the bottlenecks for critical sections. And the hope is that if you're programming with libraries, these will be done automatically. And this is the barrier, and this is for pipeline stages. Make sense? You remember all of this? Good. So we've left off actually right here. We were talking about hardware. Now that you've marked those bottlenecks, bottleneck call, bottleneck return uh, in software, and you have the bottleneck weight instruction implemented by the hardware that does hardware implemented thread weighting, what can you do with it? Right. That's actually very important that uh, uh, that identification of weighting and doing that in hardware can enable a lot of different things. Right? If you can do the weighting in hardware, thread weighting in hardware, if the hardware is aware that a thread is waiting for something with a special instruction, maybe you can do a lot of things. Maybe you can, do sh you can ship the thread somewhere else. You can switch to another thing, another context. Now if, you can, if you know how long the thread will wait, if you can somehow estimate that, then you can do even more aggressive things, right? Maybe you can uh, slow down the processor if the thread is going to wait for a long time. I mean, in a, in a complementary way, if you know how long a thread is going to execute or not wait, you can potentially enable other things, right? Maybe if you know that the thread is going to execute for a short time and going to go back to sleep or go back to waiting. Again, maybe you can uh, run your processor at a very high voltage and frequency for a short time so that you execute that thread very quickly, especially if it's an interactive thread. Maybe you would run your processor beyond the thermal limit that you can sustain at least for long periods of time uh, such that you get to that waiting phase quickly. So these are some interesting ideas, I think, to explore. If you have uh, this hardware implemented waiting, if the hardware knows whether the thread is waiting or not. Right. Okay, so the hardware, uh, well, I guess before we go into that, uh, these two are independent tasks, and this, the paper you read actually doesn't explore all of the possibilities. Uh, once you identify bottlenecks somehow, in the paper, uh, the paper identifies it as uh, thread waiting cycles, right? Something that causes a lot of serialization. Waiting is identified as a critical bottleneck. But there may be other ways of doing it. And in fact, this is an interesting and important area of research. It's a difficult area of research. Uh, but how do you do acceleration? It's also, there, there could be many ways, right? And we talked about some of this. Increasing core frequency and voltage could be one way. This is your required reading. Uh, you can prioritize the threads uh, that are bottlenecks in shared resources, like memory scheduler, so that that thread makes fast progress. That's another way of doing acceleration. And migration to faster cores and asymmetric multicore is another way of doing acceleration. And potentially there are other ways also, right? Potentially you could have some reconfigurable logic somewhere and you could reconfigure it such that it accelerates this bottleneck code. That's another way. And in the future, it's likely going to be a combination of some of these, right? Because we already have uh, the ability to increase core frequency voltage. We already have asymmetric multicores in some form. It'll become more, uh, more general as we go into the future. 
And we already have the ability to prioritize. Uh, maybe we'll have other abilities in the future. So maybe looking into ways of deciding which one is better would be an interesting, important topic. In fact, you can think of trade-offs, right? We already covered the trade-off between uh, increasing core frequency and voltage and migration to uh, a large core. You can think of uh, doing other trade-offs, when this helps, when this helps, and when this helps. And maybe you enable the right form of acceleration depending on what kind of code you're executing. Okay, so we'll cover, well, the paper you read looks at this type of acceleration. But that doesn't mean that this is the best, right? What if the code segment, the bottleneck that you've identified doesn't benefit from this? But maybe it will benefit from increasing core frequency and voltage, right? Maybe it will benefit from prioritization and shared resource, but won't benefit from one of the other ones. So it's important to identify uh, what is the best way to accelerate a code segment. And there isn't a whole lot of research uh, in that area that's done. Okay. So I'll go over this quickly because you read the paper, right? How, do, how does a BIS accelerate, or how does BIS determine thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck? Basically, there is a bottleneck table. Uh, and when a processor executes a bottleneck wait instruction, this is one of the benefits of having hardware implemented waiting. Basically, it starts waiting. The thread here starts waiting. And this information is communicated to the bottleneck table. Bottleneck table increments the number of waiters for that bottleneck. And Initially, it allocates an entry for that bottleneck with thread waiting cycle set to zero. And as the thread keeps waiting, you increment the thread waiting cycles because the number of waiters is one, right? At some point later, let's say this other core starts waiting for the same bottleneck. It sends a signal to the bottleneck table, which increments the number of waiters. And over the cycles, next few cycles, the thread waiting cycles gets incremented by the number of waiters. That's how you can figure out how much total waiting this particular bottleneck is causing in the entire system. Right? And when the uh, processor finishes executing bottleneck wait instruction, which means that now it's, it, acquire, it, it can pro proceed, maybe it acquired the lock. Right? Uh, then this small core sends a signal saying, I'm done with this bottleneck or waiting for this bottleneck. And the bottleneck table decrements this number of waiters. And when this other core finishes waiting for the bottleneck, again, it sends a signal, and the waiters uh, is decremented by the bottleneck table. Now what waiters has become zero now. Nobody's waiting. So thread waiting cycles doesn't get incremented as you go uh, forward. Simple, right? You associate thre a waiting counter, a thread waiting cycles counter with a bottleneck, and that gets incremented when a thread is waiting. Make sense? Yeah. OK. So now that's how you measure the thread waiting cycles. Now that you have that information for all bottlenecks, let's say, how do you accelerate the bottleneck? Let's take the case of two bottlenecks. Uh, one of them has accumulated thread waiting cycles of 100. Another has accumulated thread waiting cycles of 10,000 in this example. Let's say small caller gets to a bottleneck call to 4,600. Uh, before executing that bottleneck, it sends a signal to the bottleneck table asking, should I execute this locally or remotely? And the bottleneck table, there's logic here, a finite state machine that checks whether this bottleneck is worth shipping to the large core. And at least in this particular case, uh, the thread waiting cycles is compared to the threshold. And threshold happens to be uh, greater than 100. And the bottleneck table tells the small core, execute your bottleneck locally because it hasn't caused enough thread waiting cycles yet. Let's say the small core gets to another bottleneck, 4700. Again, it asks the bottleneck table, should I execute it locally? In this case, this bottleneck has caused lots of thread waiting cycles. And the prediction is that it's going to cause more thread waiting cycles as you go forward. So this is an important bottleneck, critical bottleneck. And uh, the bottleneck table tells the small core, execute your bottleneck remotely. And what does a small core do? It basically sends a, a message uh, or a packet to the large core saying, uh, I would like to execute this bottleneck ID at this program counter with this stack pointer. And this is my core ID. So please execute it for me. And it also appends the thread waiting cycles. It's not here. It's similar to accelerated critical sections, right? 
the scheduling buffer is, again, similar to accelerated critical sections. You need some sort of uh, buffer that buffers which bottlenecks are currently pending uh, to be executed. But in this case, uh, at least what the paper you read, uh, it prioritizes the bottleneck to be executed based on the thread waiting cycles. The bottleneck that has caused a lot of thread waiting cycles is deemed to be more important than another that has not caused as many waiting cycles. That may not necessarily be true, right? It is in this paper, that's the, that's the prediction mechanism. Uh, so the bottleneck that has caused the most thread waiting cycles is scheduled first. So it's not a simple FIFO queue anymore. It's more priority based and the priority is determined by the thread waiting cycles. Make sense? So all of these may not necessarily be true, right? This thread waiting cycles is really a prediction mechanism as to the importance of the bottleneck. So you can come up with potentially better prediction mechanisms. And in my opinion, there are better prediction mechanisms. We just need to discover those. That's what research is all about. And there are better prediction mechanisms according to the results in the paper, right? You've seen the results. The, uh, the accuracy of uh, the identification of the critical path is not very high. It's better than previous work, but it's not 100%, which means that there should be a better prediction mechanism. <laughs> Okay, and at some point, uh, this bottleneck becomes the highest uh, bottleneck with the highest thread waiting cycles, and then it gets scheduled by the large core. And when the large core finishes executing that bottleneck, it gets to the bottleneck return instruction, and that bottleneck return instruction basically uh, signals the small core that the bottleneck is done, so the small core can stop waiting for the bottleneck. So you could imagine uh, many different other things uh, to do when the small core is waiting for the bottleneck. If it can somehow predict how long it'll wait, maybe you switch to some other thread, right? We'll see multi-threading right after this lecture. Uh, we, a lot of processors have that support, but then the key is when do you switch and how long do you switch for? And we'll see that people have tackled that problem, uh, but they didn't have a lot of this information. So if you combine this information with multi-threading hardware, maybe you'll get uh, much better uh, systems. In existing systems, the decision, well, we'll get to multi-threading, but the decision is when you get to a long latency cache miss, for example, you switch to another thread. That may not be the right thing to do, right? If you can somehow, uh, if you know this bottleneck information, maybe you switch to another thread when you are waiting for another thread. Of course, you don't, yeah. Does that make sense? So that works when you have more threads. But keep this in mind, this is, Think about this as a substrate, maybe not the perfect substrate, but uh, beginnings of a substrate that can enable many other things. Okay? Okay, I guess there's also this stuff. So hopefully you guys remember what this was, acceleration index table. What is the purpose of this? That's right, yes. Why? Why do you want to do this? That's right, yes. So if you always access bottleneck table, which must reside somewhere globally, then you're basically uh, adding a lot of, uh, if to decide whether or not to execute your bottleneck locally or lo remotely, uh, you add a lot of latency to that decision if you need to access the bottleneck table. And this bottleneck table, maybe if, if you have a 100 core system, may be far away, right? It may take tens of cycles to decide whether you should execute locally or remotely. So it makes sense to cache these entries of the bottleneck table locally. And then the small core can quickly make a decision saying, oh, I will execute this locally or remotely. Right. That's the idea. So this is an acceleration index table. Basically, bottleneck table once in a while updates this acceleration index table saying, this bottleneck is important, this bottleneck is not important. In fact, you only need the important bottlenecks cached here, right? and which cores they should be executed at. Does that make sense? Okay, that way, the small core doesn't need to add latency to its critical path of execution, which is deciding, should I execute it locally or should I execute it remote, remotely? And this can be simple hardware. OK. So you, you've seen the mechanism, so, so I know that you've read the paper well. <laughs> and maybe a couple of other people in the back. 
So we've talked about two basic mechanisms, how do you determine thread weighting cycles and how do you accelerate bottlenecks. But the paper, if you remember, uh, there are other issues related to this. Some of these are similar to excited critical sections. False serialization is still an issue, right? Because you can have multiple independent bottlenecks executing on the same large core. And we'll talk about preemptive acceleration. That's actually an important uh, thing. This also generalizes the mechanism. And support for multiple large cores. So false serialization, if you remember, again, yeah, if you have two independent bottlenecks, you can execute only one in the large core. Or you, you can execute n in the large core, where n is your number of thread contexts. Uh, and this, this issue becomes actually worse in uh, BIS because we're picking bottlenecks in terms of their thread weighting cycles order. Right? You may send a bottleneck to the large core, and some other bottlenecks can always come to the large core that have greater thread weighting cycles, which means that you can always starve the bottleneck with the lowest thread weighting cycles. And we, were, we already talked about that. So you can have extreme false serialization, which may lead to starvation. So we want to prevent that. How do you prevent that? One way of doing it, again, this may not be the only way, uh, but large core knows which bottlenecks are scheduled and not scheduled. It can detect when a bottleneck is ready to execute in the scheduling buffer, but it cannot. But the bottleneck cannot. <laughs> Uh, and how do you do that? Basically, you know which bottlenecks are executing, and you know which bottlenecks are ready to execute, right? if you have independent bottlenecks. And it sends the bottleneck back to the small core. Right. You can, of course, do better. Right? You can predict, for example, you can have mechanisms to predict whether you will have this kind of contention. And these are all interesting research issues. I think this is not necessarily the best answer right? if you have multiple independent bottlenecks, because this may be too late. <laughs> You've already sent the bottleneck, you're shipping it back to the small core because you don't have resources to execute it. But if you som somehow have a better mechanism uh, to figure out uh, whether you can actually, you will actually run into this false serialization problem, that could be better. Maybe you could ship it somewhere else. You don't have to ship it there. Yes? Oh, I forget what the paper said if you did anything about what the small core does when it's waiting on the. Okay. Does it execute a different thread while waiting, or? So the paper didn't specify that, okay. but it could execute a different thread, right? If it's a multi-threaded processor. If it's a single-threaded processor, then it's, a be it, the, it's better not to switch to another thread, because likely that the bottleneck execution will be relatively short, mm -hmm. and thread switching overhead is much larger. Could it execute the, uh, the thread that it's sending off to the asymmetric core tentatively, and in other words, uh -huh. So if there's probably the mic kickback in the small core, it might as well just start. I see. That's a good question. Then you need to somehow, that's speculative execution, right? Mm -hmm. You're executing the bottleneck in this small core. And you will also be executing it in the large core, perhaps. Perhaps, yeah. Somehow you need to synchronize the execution in the end. You cannot do multiple stores at mm -hmm. the same time. So they would both need like big store buffers, potentially. That's right, yes. And you need to have some. But that's a, that, that could be an interesting idea, actually. What happens if you continue going? We'll, we'll, we'll cover speculation after multi-threading. So you'll see mechanisms similar to that, speculatively continuing a piece of code while you're shipping some other piece of code somewhere else. But that's, that could be interesting, especially if you've done the wrong prediction, right? It could help in this case. Yes? Uh, I, I don't know if Paul just brought this up, mm -hmm. but didn't, that, didn't this paper also talk about like preempting, uh, uh, preempting threads on, on one core if it's, uh, if, uh, yeah. The net speed up would be faster on the other core if you, if you ship the... Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that uh, right, right now. Yeah, that's a, so, <laughs> that's a different issue. Okay. <laughs> so on a completely unrelated note, um, and a lot of these papers, they just talk about this concept of a thread, uh -huh. uh, but does, do computer architects mean processes or threads mm -hmm. within the process when they say thread? So this is, uh, think of thread as a hardware context. Okay. It's whatever is executing on, the, uh, on a single context in hardware. It's an instruction stream. So that could be either a thread or a process? Yeah, that's right. Process is a higher level construct, right, uh, at the operating system level. Hardware doesn't have that notion. Well, it could have it, I guess, but in other ways, like virtual memory. But the hardware doesn't have that notion of a process. It really has this hardware context, which is the program counter, the register state, uh, and all other architectural registers that's needed. That's the thread. 
hardware context or instructional stream, as I like calling it. OK? OK. And we'll cover that more when we get to multi-threading, which is the next lecture. So, so yeah. Multi-threading refers to the hyper-threading thing in which we don't actually execute multiple threads at a time, but switch between them. Or is it like we execute the multiple, really execute the multiple threads at a time? At a time at so multi-threading, multi I guess it could mean many, many things. But multi-threading, as we covered it earlier uh, in the previous courses, is you have multiple hardware contexts on the same uh, hardware. Well, there are different flavors of multi-threading. Right? You could execute, uh, what, what, is, what does it mean to execute one at a time? There are different, you, so you could have multiple hardware contexts, but it, only one of them could be active, or all of them could be active, or a fraction of them could be active. They're all part of multi-threading. Multi-threading, the way I use it means you have multiple hardware contexts. You do something with them. OK, preemptive acceleration. This is what you brought up. Uh, actually, I don't know if you guys read this carefully, but this is a very important mechanism to accelerate uh, barriers and pipeline stages. The bottleneck identification and acceleration doesn't work if you don't do this. And hopefully, you'll tell me why. <laughs> Basically, what happens is a bottleneck that's executing on a small core can become the bottleneck with the highest thread weighting cycle. But you've already started executing the bottleneck. <laughs> so you won't get to a bottleneck call again in that bottleneck, at least the way things are done in this paper. So somehow, somebody needs to figure this out. Well, first of all, this bottleneck should really be accelerated, assuming thread waiting cycle is a good indicator of a bottleneck, uh, which means that it should be executed on the large core. But small core has already executed this bottleneck call. So somehow, somebody needs to detect the situation. In this paper, the bottleneck table somehow detects it. And there is, a, there is complexity involved in this, if you think about it deeply. This is one of the more complex parts of the mechanism. Uh, and it sends a preemption signal to the small core saying, oh, small core, you're actually executing a very important bottleneck. So ship it to the large core. This, this is, and small core, now it's already executed the bottleneck call. So it cannot just ship. It cannot just use the mechanisms that I described earlier, right? Because it's already beyond the bottleneck call. It's somewhere in the middle of the bottleneck. So it needs to save the register state on the stack, ship the bottleneck to the large core just like before. And uh, the large core basically loads the register state from the stack and executes the bottleneck. Keep ex keeps executing the bottleneck from where the small core left it off. If you think about it, this is the most general way of accelerating something. Right? You don't need any bottleneck call. If you have this kind of support in your microarchitecture, basically at any point in time, you could save the register state on stack and have a fast way of doing it, of course. Uh, ship the program counter, stack pointer, core ID to some other core. Uh, and some other core can load the register state from the stack quickly. That way, you can accelerate any piece of code. Right? So you don't need bottleneck call and return instructions. Yes? What's doing the check? Seems like something needs to be checking the bottleneck table then to say, like, hey, this is actually running way over here, but we should move this over. That's right, yes. Does that mean the large core is constantly sort of pulling the bottleneck table, mm -hmm. looking to see, and then comparing with what's running on the other cores, the smaller cores? So you could think of it. You, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to think more deeply. That's good. Uh, I won't go into it in detail, but some, somebody needs to, uh, bottlenecks need to be identified as to where they're executed. Right. So when you get to a bottleneck call, basically, you need to communicate this information also uh, to the bottleneck table. It could be part of the large core. It could be part of its own small engine. But uh, that small engine needs to be aware of which bottlenecks are executing where. You're right. And I think the paper talks about that, actually. The paper has this bottleneck. Uh, ID vector or bottleneck vector. I don't, I don't remember what it was called exactly. Uh, but you will see that in the paper. But this is the most general way of doing this. Well, this is the main acceleration mechanism for barriers and pipeline stages, at least as done in this paper. 
Why? I guess let's go back to this code. I don't know if you guys thought about this deeply, but uh, it's important to think about all of these deeply. OK, because if you're going to improve especially, you need to know exactly how things work. If you look at this, this is the bottleneck call, right? Uh, basically, this could be considered that the beginning of your parallel section. Right? OK. If you think about the threads, you've just spawned some threads, and they're all executing toward the barrier. This is the barrier code. At the beginning of this, you do a bottleneck call. That's what this code is. That's how this code is written. Uh, and that bottleneck call, well, let's see. It's the, it starts executing the code running for the barrier. Right. And that code running for the barrier runs for a while. Uh, and let's say this thread reaches the end. When it reaches the bottleneck return, now it enters the barrier. And it does bottleneck wait, because not all threads are in the barrier. Right? At this point, the thread waiting cycles for this bottleneck ID starts getting incremented, assuming everything starts from 0. And then another thread reaches the barrier, and that thread waiting cycle starts getting incremented, incremented by 2. Right? At some point, let's say the thread waiting cycles becomes very large, because these two threads have been waiting for a long time. Assume that these are going on. They haven't reached the barrier yet. Now the bottleneck table can detect the situation and say, oh, thread waiting cycles for this particular bottleneck ID is huge. And these two threads are actually executing bottleneck calls for that bottleneck ID. Then it can start accelerating these threads, right? But then these threads are already somewhere in the middle of this code that's running for the barrier. Then the question is, which one do you accelerate? <laughs> If you have two cores, you would accelerate both, probably. But if you have one core, which one do you pick? You have no idea when one of them will, which one will reach the barrier first. Right. So you can see why you really need preemptive acceleration for this case, right? Now, another way of doing this is somehow predicting which, which thread will be the bottleneck. That's a harder problem, even. Like, even at the beginning of this, how do you predict which thread will be the bottleneck? If you have higher level information somehow, maybe you can predict. If you have load information, load imbalance information between different threads, right? How much work they're going to do. But what if they're all equal? Or even if they're not all equal, one thread may have a lot of work, but then microarchitecture, it may execute fast, right? So I think in the end, uh, you need a combination of prediction mechanisms and this kind of mechanisms to identify which thread is lagging. And that's, again, another area that's not very well understood at this point. Okay. Actually, a similar uh, problem happens with the uh, pipeline stages. I will not cover that. But to be able to detect pipeline stages, to be able to accelerate pipeline stages, you need preemptive acceleration, again, because you're running the bottleneck call, which is actually the work that you're doing for the pipeline. And at some point, you may become critical. You meaning the thread that's executing uh, the pipeline stage. OK. But I'd encourage you to think more about this, because this is uh, going forward as we have more accelerators on chip, and as we want to accelerate at a finer grain uh, pieces of code, especially automatically, this kind of preemptive acceleration mechanism will become more important. We will need support very fast support for preempting a thread, saving its state, and sending it somewhere else. OK. Any questions on this? If you haven't thought about it uh, while reading the paper, this is, a, uh, this, is, this is something important to think about, the previous one. Support for multiple large cores, this is easier. Uh, to ex basically, the goal is to accelerate independent bottlenecks. And if, if you see the paper as an else on do you want to have multiple threads on the same core versus do you want to have multiple large cores, right? So hopefully you have the, you understand the trade-offs. If you have multiple threads on the same core, they contend for the core, which means that the acceleration will not be as effective because they're going to share resources. Whereas if you have multiple cores, the acceleration will be more effective, right? Because 
these cores do not share resources at least as tightly as multiple threads on the same core share resources. So the goal of having multiple large cores to accelerate independent bottlenecks, of course you need to have a scheduling buffer in each core and you can still have uh, multi-threading in each core, in this case SMT because the cores were out of order. And uh, you can devise mechanisms to have bottleneck table assign each bottleneck to a fixed large core. So you don't want to have the same bottleneck, different instances of the same bottleneck go to different large cores, right? Because then you'll have a scheduling problem. You don't want to execute them concurrently. Or maybe you can execute them concurrently, but you need to be able to detect whether they conflict it. And we'll cover that when we cover speculation. Uh, and there are two reasons for it. One is, well, one is correctness reasons. The second is you want to preserve cache locality and you want to avoid uh, busy waiting. Okay. And you need to ex extend preemptive acceleration too. So you see, you see that this is getting more and more complex, right? It's not, it's not as elegant anymore. So that's another area, how to make this a lot more elegant and a lot more simple. Okay. What is the hardware cost of all this? Uh, basically, other than the implementation complexity cost, you've read the hardware cost probably. The storage cost is not that significant. The bigger difficulty is the implementation complexity. And that's usually the case in a lot of the ideas. The complexity that you need to add to support all of this. Well, maybe multiple large cores is not bad, but preemptive acceleration and false serialization, shipping back and shipping forward. That complexity is a lot more important usually than the hardware cost itself, the storage cost itself. But storage cost is easier to quantify than implementation complexity. Okay, but the, the good news is that whenever you design mechanisms like this, you should have these on, off the critical path. <laughs> they should not be affecting the critical path of either the logic or the program execution. Okay, performance trade-offs, uh, I think we've covered a lot of these, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. Well, I guess actually we've covered all of these, right? <laughs> It's very similar to ACS, faster bottleneck execution versus fewer parallel threads. You should know this by heart by now. <laughs> and you can, this is not necessarily a trade-off if you are multi-threading, but then it's again a trade-off because bottleneck execution is not as fast. Uh, you get better shared data locality and worse private data locality. Uh, that's actually, that could actually be another interesting project, uh, how to optimize just for locality. Maybe not accelerate bottlenecks, but how do you uh, divide your program uh, that access, where threads access shared data. Uh, divide the execution of the program on different cores such that you improve locality itself. So if you do not have a large core, if you just had all small cores, you can still get significant benefit by executing bottlenecks or assigning particular cores to, for particular bottlenecks. Right? This bottleneck ID goes to this core, this bottleneck ID goes to this core, this bottleneck ID goes to this core. The advantage of that would be assuming you get better locality because the bottlenecks that are accessing the shared data execute on the same core and same cache, then you'll get higher performance, even without having a large core or increasing the frequency. Yes? The configuration which we discussed, uh, which had like only large cores, but they had multiple like, support. <laughs> That could be useful in some situations like you could uh, continue to execute in multi threaded mode and once you identify a bottleneck change that was single threaded mm -hmm. mode and in that case the cache, the data will already be there. So. That's right. Yeah, that, 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 that has that advantage, right? That you don't need to move that. Well, then you can both accelerate and have the shared data look out. Okay, and there's the benefit of acceleration versus still migration latency. And the, uh, this was more of an issue with accelerated critical sections, right? Remember that paper? When you get to a critical section, ship it to the large core. If the critical section is not contended, that may not be good because now you're adding more latency. Migration latency may be on the critical path. Here, uh, only the contended or predicted contended bottlenecks, critical sections, are shipped to the large core, which means that the hope is that while you're migrating, 
an instance of a bottleneck, there's another instance of a bottleneck that's executing on the large core. So you're overlapping that execution latency with the migration latency. You are going to be waiting for that bottleneck anyway, in all likelihood. And that's usually the case in here, but not always again, because that, again, thread waiting cycle is a predictor for the critical path. It's not, it's not perfect. Okay. Okay, you, re you read the uh, methodology in the paper. I will not cover this in detail, but this is also important for your projects. It's important to think about how you're going to evaluate your ideas. Right? Usually when you modify hardware, you cannot build the hardware, unless you're going to take <laughs> 10 years or so to build the hardware. So you simulate, right? You simulate to figure out whether the ideas make sense. Uh, and that's what we did. And that's what you will do in most of your projects at least. This depends on the project, but so it's important to be familiar with the simulator that you very, very familiar with the simulator. Uh, okay, in this case, these are very similar to the parameters that we had for ACS. Okay. So comparison points, you read this, so I'll go over this quickly also. Asymmetric CMP is the baseline. ACS is another baseline, X-ray critical sections, feedback directed pipelining. We've talked about this, right? It's a software-based library. I did not assign this. Would you like to read that also for the, for the reviews that are due on Friday? No? <laughs> There's strong objection on that side of the room. This side of the room can read it. That side of the room <laughs> can have a pass. <laughs> but that's a good paper to read also. That's, uh, Basically, it accelerates only the slowest pipeline stage, and it's applicable to pipeline parallel workloads. And accelerated critical sections is not applicable to pipeline parallel workloads, it's applicable to critical sections. And one of the, uh, one of the contributions of this work, bottleneck identification, is to un have a unified mechanism for bottlenecks. Okay, and these are uh, some results. I'll not go over this in uh, detail, but I'll point out again uh, the the number of threads for each mechanism and each benchmark is set to the optimal number of threads where performance actually saturates. It's not set to 32 or it's not set to 8. It's not set to a specific number per benchmark. It's set to the best number per benchmark and system configuration. For a given benchmark and a system, you can determine what's the best number of threads for that particular workload. Now, in practice, this may not be easy to detect, but to show your results actually are good, it's important to show it this way. Because in practice, it's actually a practical problem. How does the programmer, or how does someone, the system, know how many threads to use, how many threads to execute in a workload? This depends on the input set. This depends on the contention characteristics in hardware. So you really need a dynamic mechanism to decide this, actually. And I've already recommended you a paper uh, that talks about feedback-driven threading, uh, feedback threading in ASPLOS 2008. So take a look at that. But this is very important. This is a, this is a, this is a better, much better baseline than you could have gotten by actually picking the number of threads per benchmark, because now we're picking the number of threads per benchmark and system configuration. Okay. And I guess the baseline here is the ACMP. That's this bar. And the blue bars are ACS and FDP applied to different sets of benchmarks. Actually, I think the FDP also has ACS, but these benchmarks do not have a lot of critical sections. They're more pipeline parallel. Mm. And if you look at this, there's significant performance gain from BIS compared to a combination of ACS and FDP, especially for those benchmarks where limiting bottlenecks change over time. And there are benchmarks where you have, you're bound by the barriers, and ACS cannot accelerate those barriers, right? I guess it could accelerate, but it's too late. <laughs> and that's the performance result. And this improves also scalability, as you might expect. Okay, so this also, uh, I, you've hopefully read this in the paper, but this is 
uh, an interesting offline analysis that tries to quantify the fraction of execution time that's spent on predicted important bottlenecks. So if you think about ACS, let's take the example of ACS. ACS predicts every critical section to be a bottleneck. Right? It ships that to the large core. So what fraction of the execution time is actually spent on those critical sections? Uh, well, I animated it early, and I don't know what happened. Maybe it's signaling that we should take a break, but <laughs> let's go back again here. OK. Uh, so ACS predicts that uh, approximately 53% or so of the execution time is spent on bottlenecks, right? These are, this is, you can think of this as the large core utilization also. Right? Large core is executing a bottleneck 53% of the time. And with this bottleneck identification and scheduling, that increases because now we are covering more bottlenecks. Right? But this doesn't mean that all of this stuff that's executing on the large core is actually critical. How do you identify what is critical? Well, you need to do an analysis that actually figures out what is the critical path of the program. Right? Well, it's not easy to do because that changes based on your decision. Right? So this is all offline analysis. Offline meaning there is no acceleration that's happening here. And somehow you figure out what is the thread that's on the critical path of execution. And I'd, I encourage you to think about how you can figure that out. It's not an easy problem. You somehow need to start from the end of the program, right? And figure out what thread is the last one to reach the end of the program. And then go back, what thread uh, feeds that thread. And figure out which thread is on the critical path at any given point in time in the program, right? Here, for example, let's say, mm, let's say this is the end of your program. And the last thread that reaches uh, this is on the critical path, right? But there's some other thread here that comes here. Right? So you need to do an analysis of which one is on the critical path at any given point in time. And you can do that by, uh, for example, at some point, uh, this thread or this thread may be waiting for some other thread. And that, because of that, uh, it becomes on the critical path. And you need to do that dependency analysis. So this is a good exercise for any of you who want to determine what's the critical path. You have to go backwards. And that's what this analysis is about. So once you do that analysis, you can figure out whether or not the bottleneck that's currently, that's deemed to, be executed on the large core is actually on the critical path. Right. And this is what the result says. Basically, it says that uh, only this fraction of the bottlenecks are actually on the critical path. And it's 39%. If you think about the coverage of this mechanism, it's the fraction of the program critical path that is actually identified as bottlenecks. And that's only 39% with the ACS and FTP. With BIS, if you look at this, this is the 39%. It's almost 40, right? This green bar. With BIS, that increases to 59%. So you can detect 59% of the program uh, critical path in a multi-threaded application. That's still very low, right? 59%. So what is the accuracy of detection? This is basically. Uh, identified bottlenecks on the critical path over total identified bottlenecks in terms of execution time. And that, that means for ACS and FTP, it's the fraction of this green here over the fraction of the blue. That's your accuracy. Because you're inaccurate with this blue part. Because you've shipped it to the large core, or you've predicted that it should be shipped, it, shipped to the large core. But it's actually not on the critical path. Okay. So that's about 72% here. And that's about 74% if you compare this green on the right hand uh, with the uh, total height of that bar. Make sense? So I'm, I'm spending time on this because it's actually an important thing to do when you design a mechanism. This kind of tells why does it work, right? Because you're actually identifying the critical path somehow. And this also kind of tells you what the potential is. But what are you missing? And this was interesting data because we're missing 40% of the program critical path. And in fact, it's 
much worse on some applications, right? If you look at spec JBB, the critical path that's being covered is about, I guess this is 5%, yeah, 5% or so. Even though lots of things, well, about 30% of the execution time actually is spent on the large core. And this is offline analysis also. This may not be fully accurate because we're not actually accelerating. We're just analyzing offline whether the prediction is correct. In a real system, you not only predict that it should be executed on the large core, but you actually execute it on the large core, which changes the critical path. Because once you accelerate something, that may not be on the critical path anymore. So this analysis, online analysis, is much, much harder to do. In fact, it's, it's MP complete. I don't know how to do it. If you guys figure out how to do it, <laughs> let me know. Because <laughs> this is a very tough problem. Not only it's MP complete, I just don't know how to simulate it. Because some MP complete problems you can just try to do with brute force, right, if the problem is constrained. But here, it's not even clear how you do it brute force. Because once you accelerate something, the critical path changes. Maybe you'll figure it out. You guys are smart, so <laughs> aim high. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so that was an important slide. Uh, if, you, if you do this kind of analysis, that adds a lot of value to your mechanism because it gives this understanding that's not necessarily available otherwise. Okay. So this uh, some sensitivity results. This is a scaling result. You read the paper. But as you increase the number of small cores, performance also increases, or performance improvement increases with this. That's because as you add more cores, more threads, the contention increases, right? Because you're uh, parallelizing in a more finer grain. And also, the overhead of the large core reduces, right? If you have eight cores, and if you dedicate four cores, eight small cores, and if you dedicate four small core area, to a large core, then you're reducing your parallel throughput a lot. Whereas here, you don't have that reduction. And as you add more cores, you can accelerate independent bottlenecks, and that actually helps uh, performance a little bit. But it has diminishing returns. So adding more cores, more large cores, doesn't necessarily help you in the end. Because you may not have lots of different bottlenecks executing at the same time. right? But adding two is a good idea, and three is slightly better. Of course, this is true if your area is large. If this area was eight, equal, eight uh, equal in small cores, then you have a problem, right? How do you allocate your budget? That's why it's interesting to look at cores that can transform themselves to large cores and small cores, depending on the need, whether you're parallel or serial. OK. So to summarize, I think we've talked about this many times, but serializing bottlenecks you have different types, and they limit performance of parallel applications. And importance of these bottlenecks changes over time. So it's important to adapt at a fine grain. Uh, BIS is one way of tackling the problem. It's a hardware software cooperative solution. Uh, it dynamically identifies bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerates them on large cores of an ACMP, asymmetric multi-core. And these are the bottlenecks that, are, that is applicable to critical sections, barriers, and pipeline stages. And there are others. Uh, and the key idea is if a bottleneck is causing a lot of thread weighting, it's on the critical path. And these are the results. So the hope is that this can provide a fine-grained bottleneck acceleration mechanism or substrate with little or no programmer effort. But you can do much better than this, I think. This is. OK, maybe we should take a break before we move on. I'm hoping to finish all of this by today so that we can start on multi-threading in the next lecture. OK, we'll talk about stage execution. And you read the paper, so this will go fast, right? If you think about this, the most general way of parallelizing programs is really dividing up arbitrarily a program into pieces. Right? And you can think of all of these models as an example, as examples of stage execution. Basically, you can split program code into segments. And if you want to get the best, be, uh, best of acceleration and best of asymmetry, you somehow identify which segment is executed best 
on which core for some defi definition of best uh, or best suited. And it just doesn't need to be a core. Uh, it could be uh, different memory hierarchies also, right, as we discussed last time. And each core can be assigned a work queue storing segments to be run. And you've seen the benefits of this. There are three at least high level benefits. One is you can accelerate some of these segments and critical paths using specialized heterogeneous cores. And acceleration is not only for performance, but that could also enable energy efficiency because you're really customizing. And you could customize to different degrees, as we briefly discussed. Uh, you can exploit inter-segment parallelism because you're executing these segments in parallel. That improves performance. And that can enable uh, power efficiency. And you can also improve locality within the segment data. If you divide these segments such that uh, segments that share the data execute on the same core, you can improve locality. Right? Instead of moving the data uh, across different cores uh, when different segments or when segments that share the data execute on different cores. And examples, there are many examples. Accelerated critical section is an example. I will cover this. BIS is an example. I will not cover this in this talk, uh, in, the, in the rest of this. Uh, Producer-consumer pipeline parallelism, that's an example. The task parallelism models that's employed, uh, that are employed today uh, are examples. And I, I encourage you to look these up. Silk is one model of exploiting task parallelism. It was proposed in 1995. And I guess Apple has its own model of task parallelism also. They call it the Grand Central Dispatch. You get these tasks and you dispatch these tasks to different cores. And special, uh, special purpose cores can be managed this way. Maybe it's not an example of this model, but you can manage them using uh, the segments. So at the most general form, you could take a program and chop it into segments. It could be a loop iteration where you have segment zero feeding into segment one, feeding into segment two. And there may be a lot of communication with these segments. And this segment may be working on a chunk of data. This segment may be working on another chunk of data. And this segment may be working on another chunk of data. And then you can have instances of segment zero executing on core zero, instances of segment one executing on core one, and instances of segment two executing on core two. And you can potentially specialize these cores based on the needs of the segment. So how does this work? Uh, this is one way of doing it. Segment zero, for example, can execute and spawn another segment. Maybe you have a spawn instruction somewhere. Maybe it's a critical section call instruction. Right? Maybe it's a bottleneck call instruction. Or maybe it's no instruction at all. It's preemptive. Right? You just randomly decide that, ran maybe not randomly, intelligently decide that this segment has become on the critical path, so I'm going to spawn the next segment on some other core. And this segment can also spawn some other segment. Excited critical sections, we've covered this. You can think of segment zero as a, uh, you can think of non-critical sections as segment zero and critical section as segment one. So you can have two segments. And you know what the benefits are. Producer-consumer pipeline parallelism, we've also covered this. Basically, a loop is divided into pipeline stages where one stage feeds into the other stage. It's producer-consumer. It's also called uh, pipeline, uh, just pipeline parallelism or producer-consumer parallelism. I just use both words here. But you, you can hear producer-consumer parallelism. When, when people talk about producer-consumer parallelism, it's usually this kind of programming model. A thread produces data for the other thread. That produces data for another thread. In this case, you can think of the pipeline stages as segments. OK. So with all of these uh, models, uh, there is one problem, which is the locality of intersegment data. When you spawn a segment to the other core, to another core, uh, that segment gets a cache miss on the data produced by the previous segment. And this happens a lot in producer-consumer pi pipeline parallelism. Right. In this case, it's load y. It's really data that's produced by the previous segment, which happens to be executed on some other core. So you get a cache miss when you execute the segment one on core one. So you need to transfer the, through the coherence protocol 
uh, this data, this cache line that houses y. Right. Similarly, when this load z executes, it gets a cache miss. So you need to transfer through the Corian's protocol the cache line that contains z. This is the intersegment data. And that's a problem with accelerated critical sections, and we've covered this, right? The, you could think of this as segment private data. Uh, well, maybe it's not pri private, it may not be the right word, but it is produced by, the, by another segment. Uh, for example, a critical section incurs a cache miss when it touches data that's produced in the non-critical section. This is thread private data, right? It's not shared. It's input to the critical section. In producer-consumer pipeline parallelism, a stage incurs a cache miss when it touches data produced by the previous stage because it was produced in a different score. And performance of stage execution, all of these models, will in the end be limited by intersegment cache misses. You have to transfer this data somehow. So what if you eliminated all intersegment misses? You probably remember this from the paper or something similar to this. Uh, in accelerated critical sections, and this is one particular simulation result, uh, you can do the ideal experiment, right? And I'd encourage you to do ideal experiments whenever you have uh, the ability to do so. What if in the ideal case I would have solved this problem? What benefit would I get? And accelerated critical, basically how, how did we do this experiment? You can say when the segment executes, when it touches data that's produced by another segment, I'm going to assume that it's going to hit in the cache. You can simulate this. Ideally, it's magic. It's unimplementable, of course, but you could use that in your simulator. You could figure out whether the data is coming from a previous segment. That's easy. And you could force that to be a cache hit. Right? That's the beauty of simulation. You can do things that you cannot do in real hardware. And that's how you can advance things much faster. If you were limited by just what you could do in hardware, you couldn't even imagine this. Right? So we did that. and. Accelerated critical sections performance would increase by 10% if you actually do this perfectly. If every intersegment cache miss was converted into a cache hit. Now 10% may not sound that high, but I'll show you, well, the paper that you read showed you a mechanism that gets most of that benefit. In fact, almost all of that benefit, right? So that's important. And that's an important benefit. And as the number of cores increases, this becomes a bigger problem. In pipeline parallelism, the performance benefit is, ideal performance benefit is about 20%. And again, the paper you read shows a mechanism uh, that gets most of that benefit. Okay? So you, you can tell me the idea now, <laughs> now that you've read it. <laughs> I'll cover it quickly. Uh, the terminology, uh, let me define terminology first. So intersegment data, I've been using that, assuming that you know it, but you should know it. It's basically the cache block written by one segment and consumed by the next segment. Right. In this case, the cache block that contains Y and the cache block that contains Z is intersegment data. And we'll, term, we'll use the term generator instruction, which is the last instruction to write to an intersegment cache block or to intersegment data in a segment. In this case, this store Y instruction, the second one, is the generator instruction. It generates the intersegment data and stores Z also. So the key observation in this work is uh, that the set of generator instructions is stable over execution time and phases right? uh, and input sets. Well, maybe not phases. Stable over execution time uh, and, and across input sets. Actually, it is stable over phases too, but I think that's not, that may not be true in all cases. So the idea is to identify the generator instructions somehow. Uh, and uh, we'll use software to do that. But I'd encourage you to think about using hardware also. Actually, uh, Otter, who did this work, he has mechanisms to do it in purely in hardware also. It's not that hard to do it in hardware. You can imagine ways of doing that. That could be a very good exam question, actually. How would you identify generator instructions in a state execution model? In hardware, purely in hardware. I'll tell you the software way. You can think of how do you do that in the hardware. I mean, you may, this question may come later in life <laughs> at some point. <laughs> and Han will remind me, hopefully. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So identify generated instructions, and you can record the cache blocks produced by the generated instructions once you've identified them. And once you recorded the cache blocks produced by the generated instructions, when you spawn, or before you spawn the next segment, you can proactively send such cache blocks to the next segment's core. Yes? Um, so is this the union of all data which might be used in a control path in that next segment? That's right, yes. Okay. So that, that's part of where the inaccuracy will come from. Right? Yeah, so it seems like you could produce, like, let's say, two large data sets, only one of which will be used, and then... Yeah. Yeah, if there's an if and else yeah. in the next segment, then if the next segment doesn't touch that data. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think it would be good to do like uh, runtime profiling on like, okay, it seems like only the segments I won't ever use during lifetime of this program? Mm -hmm. So you could, do, you could do it, or you could somehow figure out which data is actually used. Mm -hmm. But that's a harder problem, right? Because it depends on the control flow path. Too. Yeah. But that's, that's one way of improving this work, figuring out actually which data is used. I don't know how much potential there is. There may not be a whole lot of potential, at least with these workloads. OK, and you read this paper. And this is, again, a hardware-software cooperative mechanism. But again, as I said, it can be done purely in hardware, much more easily than the bottleneck identification work. Uh, basically, the compiler or profiler, and even the programmer can do this, identifies generator instructions and inserts these Marshall instructions, uh, and I'll tell you what these are while you read it. And it, 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 it generates a binary that contains these generator prefixes for an instruction. These are store instructions that happen to generate intersegment data and Marshall instructions. And hardware, when it sees the generator instructions, it records generator produced addresses. And when it sees a Marshall instruction, it starts streaming uh, the cache blocks at the addresses that are recorded to the next core. That's the idea. How does the compiler do this? You read the paper, so I'm not going to go into detail. Basically, the segments are somehow marked. Of course, this is harder to do if your segments are dynamically constructed, right? If you do preemptive acceleration, for example, without any knowledge of uh, where your segment is going to happen, it's harder to do at compile time, right? Because you don't know what your boundaries are. But if, you, if these are marked at compile time, then the compiler can run this entire thing as a single threaded code, and it can figure out when this communication happens, right, across segments. And, and it can also do a cache model to figure out whether you get cache misses. Let's say this load Y, and in this case, we didn't do a cache model, but you can predict that this, when this load touches an intersegment data that was produced by the previous segment, you can guess that it's going to be a cache miss. And that's the guess of the compiler. In that case, the compiler marks the last instruction that's stored to that cache block as the generator instruction. That's the idea. And you, you, that way, you can mark the generator instructions. Then the question is, where do you insert the Marshall instructions? Again, the compiler can, can have an algorithm for this. Uh, so Marshall instructions, there are two reasons for this. Uh, they basically, when they're executed, they tell the hardware to send the blocks. And they also tell the hardware, an instruction also tells the hardware where to send the block, right? which, which segment. In this case, C1 is the identifier of this segment. But when you actually generate the code, you don't know the physical core that executes this, right? So the compiler or the library somehow needs to emit code where the C1 is actually virtual, right? It's a segment ID. Somehow, somebody needs to bind that to a physical core ID. That needs to be done in hardware, right? that binding. OK. So what are the support of this? Basically, uh, well, you need new instructions. Uh, you need to add them uh, to the binary. And the library and the hardware together bind the next segment ID to a physical core. And you read the hardware needs to have these abilities. Have a Marshall buffer, as I'll describe briefly. Uh, basically, it stores physical address of cache blocks to be marshaled. Uh, it needs to handle the new instructions. And it needs to have the ability to push data to another cache. We've covered coherence in 447. Uh, we're going to cover it in more detail, but you can think of what is needed 
And the paper describes uh, some of the changes that's needed to make this work. Normally, you don't push data to another cache, right? In this case, you will need, will need to push the data to another cache. What if it's a modified block? Well, in this case, it's going to be a modified block, right? <laughs> Do you have two modified blocks in both caches? Probably not. OK, you can think about that in more detail. And you read the paper, so you know that this provides timely data transfer because you're pushing the data to the core before it's needed instead of the core pulling the data. Uh, you this can marshal any arbitrary sequence of lines because you identify the generators, not patterns. If you think about the prefetchers that we've discussed, they identify patterns, right? And if there's no pattern in the data, you cannot uh, do good prefetching. And it has low hardware cost. This advances, it requires profiler and ISA support. This is, by the way, this is a good way of doing the reviews, for example. If you review this paper, if you write this, this is a good way of identifying the advantages and disadvantages of the paper. Because you're really focusing on the mechanism. These are the big advantages and these are the disadvantages. It's not always accurate, uh, as Paul uh, mentioned, because you're marshalling all of the data that's produced by a generator instruction. You don't know whether actually it will be used, right? Basically, you're marshalling more data than needed, potentially, because you may have an if and else statement that's depend on one of the pieces of data that decides whether, uh, whether or not to use the other pieces of data right, that, that are marshaled. So this can cause pollution at the remote course cache because you're sending stuff that may not necessarily be needed. And it can cause wasted bandwidth on the interconnect. But it turns out, at least for these workloads, the, this is not a large problem as the number of intersegment blocks is small. And it kind of makes sense that these are small, right? You can think about it. So how does this work with accelerated critical sections? Basically, some instructions are marked as generated instructions, and small core is executing this non-critical section. We add the Marshall buffer here. And when it gets to a generated instruction, the store generates an address of the cache block that contains Y. That address is recorded in the Marshall buffer. And let's assume you have other instructions that are executed and generators. Then you populate this Marshall buffer with the generated addresses. At some point, the small core executes the critical section call, which implicitly serves as a Marshall instruction. It doesn't have to. Maybe you start marshalling earlier, right? If the compiler figures out when you can start marshalling. But in this case, let's say we're going to use a critical section call as a Marshall instruction. When the core executes the critical section call, there's some logic in the Marshall buffer that goes through each entry, each populate and the inter-Marshall buffer, takes the address, reads the data from the L2 cache, and sends the address and the data to the L2 cache of the large core, or the next segment. And when the critical section, and this transfer is hopefully overlapped with the transfer of state to the large core. Right. Transfer of uh, the computation, to the critical section, because you need to also send a critical section call request. And also, hopefully, this, over, uh, this transfer of data is overlapped by uh, overlap with the execution of other instances of the same critical section, assuming that critical section is contended in the large core. So this may not be on the critical path. Right? And hopefully, when this critical section gets, starts executing, you get a cache hit. That way, this critical section doesn't need to pull the data. Make sense? So what is the effect of this? Same, uh, same workloads. It improves performance by 8.7%. I guess the red bar is the ideal. The uh, red bar is the data marshalling over accelerated critical sections. Uh, and this is the ideal. So we get, you can get very close to ideal, basically. And pipeline parallelism is similar, a little bit more complicated, because you, now you need marshal buffers in all cores. Right? Think of core 0 producing data for core 1, producing data for core 2. Your pipeline that way. Segment 0 executes on core 0. It gets to a generated instruction. Its address gets recorded in the Marshall buffer. When the Marshall instruction executes, you somehow have a binding of this virtual core ID to a physical core ID, core one. And the Marshall buffer goes through each entry, takes the address, takes the data, sends it to the physical core that the C1 is bound to. 
And hopefully when this segment needs that data, when it executes, it gets the data uh, from the cache. And if it, even if it's not in the cache, hopefully it's in transit somewhere. So you will overlap some latency. Make sense? And what is the impact of this on par pipeline parallelism? These are pipeline parallel workloads. And you can look at the paper for these. Uh, and the performance improvement is about 16% in this 32 core uh, CMP. And in, in this case, it's all symmetric multi-core. We're not doing any bottleneck identification here. It's just uh, accelerating the pipeline parallel workload. Uh, well, it's just improving locality, intersegment data locality in the pipeline parallel workload without acceleration, without a large core. And this is close to, again, uh, the ideal. And there are cases where the Marshall buffer is small. That's why you don't get uh, uh, the full performance benefit of the ideal. Okay. So you could think of this as kind of like a prefetcher, right? You're, you're really not pulling the data, but you're pushing the data to where it's needed. And the goal is to, again, tolerate that latency, to reduce that latency of use. So you could use the common metrics used for prefetching, which you all remember from previous courses, right? Coverage, accuracy, timeliness. Coverage is essentially what fraction of the intersegment cache misses, data cache misses, are actually uh, prefetched, right, or sent. And that tends to be pretty high because the, if you correctly identify the generator instructions, then you're going to send all of the data that is produced by them. I guess in this case, we don't correctly identify in the pipeline parallel program those generated instructions. That could be true depending on the input set again, because you could have an if else in the producer side, right? And if, the, if your profiling input set executes only one path, you may not be able to cap capture that producer instruction that happens on the other path, right? That's the importance of having more representative profiling input sets. Whereas if you did this dynamically, purely in hardware, your coverage will very likely increase. Except there are cases where you need to first identify these generator instructions. So at that point, you may not have good coverage. Okay, Accuracy is uh, basically what fraction of the sent or pushed cache blocks are actually used in the destination segment. And that's lower because of all these ifs analysis. That's the problem you mentioned. The accuracy is not very high. And timeliness is when the destination segment needs that data, what fraction of the time that data is actually in the cache? Of course, this is a very strict definition of timeliness, right? Because it could be in transit. You're a little bit not so timely, but you can still get benefit. And that's also high. And medium accuracy doesn't affect performance because not many cache blocks are marshaled. If you're marshalling 10,000 cache blocks, this could affect performance badly, right? If you're marshalling only 5 to 6.8 cache blocks, you're sending that to the cache of the large core, evicting some other cache blocks in the cache of the large core or the destination core, which may not be that bad because when you uh, send inaccurate things, you may lose performance. Right? But then you, if you remember from previous courses, a lot of the cache blocks in a large L2 cache are dead, which means that they're not going to be used anyway. So if these are replacing things that are not going to be used anyway, you don't significantly affect performance. You're just wasting bandwidth. And we'll talk about that problem next uh, week. OK. Uh, so scaling results, I like the slide because actually this would be a good exam question also. <laughs> Although I give the answer here, I should have animated this. <laughs> but performance improvement of data marshalling increases as you, uh, with three big trends in computing. More cores, higher interconnect latency, and larger private L2 caches. And the question is why? This could, this could still be a great exam question. <laughs> uh, why? Because, well, at the high level, intersegment data miss has become a larger bottleneck. But why? As you had more cores, now you're parallelizing your program in a more finer grain, right? Which means that you have more communication, naturally. You have to ship the data more. 
That's the reason. Now, more communication means more intersegment data misses. That's the definition of intersegment data miss. If you have higher latency in the interconnect, now you're communicating and your stalls are longer when you communicate, which means that if you have a mechanism to eliminate those stalls, you get higher performance benefit. And if you have a larger private L2 cache, uh, this doesn't help, right? Because a larger cache helps if you have locality. But these misses that, you, that the next segment gets is not a miss because of locality, right? Well, it is, I guess, locality, but uh, it's a communication miss. You couldn't have cached it because you did not produce it. Somebody else produced it. And this becomes a bigger problem. If you increase your L2 cache size, you could cache the things that you have produced, the segment has produced, so you get better locality for the within segment data. That makes intersegment data a bigger bottleneck, right? Because you're eliminating all other misses, and communication misses are the only ones you may not eliminate. Does that make sense? So now you know how to answer this question. <laughs> Especially the last one. The answer is uh, here important because you're eliminating at least whatever caches can eliminate. You're eliminating all of those misses uh, that the cache can eliminate, assuming you have locality. But what's remaining is really these misses, communication misses. Okay, there are other applications of this, and I'd encourage you to think about these. Uh, there could be interesting research avenues, again, in this direction. Uh, can you apply something like this to other models? And I think the answer is yes, but it's not, there are issues related to all of these models. Uh, for example, Apple Grand Central Dispatch, you can, I think, do something similar uh, in what they have. Uh, special purpose remote functional units, you could do this, for example, in CPU versus GPU at a very fine grain. And in the future, it will happen. Uh, today, the programmer does it, right? Programmer marshals the data to a GPU and at a very, not a very fine grain, but at a very coarse grain because the communication latency is huge and, the, and CPU, GPU is really a device. So you just ship huge amounts of data to the GPU and programmer needs to handle that. But that's one of the problems in programming GPUs, right? Because it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that automatically or in a, in a performance optimal way. But this alleviates, data marshalling alleviates some of the burden from the programmer. Again, you can think of this as support for the programmer. Programmer doesn't need to marshal the data. Somehow hardware figures it out. And ideally, you would like something like this. Okay, there are other papers, and you can look up, look up these papers. Uh, and, uh, and this will become a bigger problem as we go into the future, as we parallelize in a finer grain. Because this data migration overhead uh, is an important overhead if you want to do remote execution, just like GPUs, right? It's a big overhead today. There are issues related to architecture, but as you fine grain, uh, as you have GPUs and CPUs closer together, it will, it will be an even bigger overhead. So you can enable more finer grain parallelization. Any questions on this? I'd encourage you to think about this more. Okay, I think I'll just summarize. We've talked about intersegment data transfers between cores. These limit the benefit of these staged execution models, of which there are many. Uh, and one solution is data marshalling, or automatic data marshalling, which is a hardware software cooperative solution. The idea is to detect intersegment instruct, uh, data generator instructions and push their data to the next segment's core. And it achieves most of the potential of eliminating, completely eliminating such cache misses. And this was a hardware software cooperative solution, but I think a pure hardware solution may, may work also. And I guess it's your homework to think about it because it may appear later on. <laughs> okay, and you've got the performance there. So if you've done distributed programming, you, you would do something like this, right? You guys are familiar with the remote procedure calls? How, how many of you have done programming with RPC or remote procedure calls? One, two, three, four, five, 
That's a small fraction. Maybe we should do more of this. Have you done it in classes or have you done it in other places? Internship. Internship. You too, internship? Who has done it in classes? Two? Okay. Maybe we should have more classes doing <laughs> distributed programming. <laughs> but this is essentially a remote procedure call. Uh, well, in remote procedure calls, uh, you have this client and the server. Basically, there is some function in the server that the client can invoke. Right. Client can say, uh, execute this function for me. I don't know, it could be the update of a bank account, maybe. Something like that. And of course, uh, the, the goal is to have the server executed and return the answer. Right. But this function needs some arguments, right? And these arguments are actually marshaled to the server. And the programmer figures out what those arguments are and sends them to the server. And it's fun to program these systems. <laughs> So if, you, if you've done, for example, uh, like how many of you are familiar with CVS? CVS is where multiple people uh, collaborate on um, a project and you can do multi updates uh, to a common file, for example. That's programmed this way. You can read the CVS code. <laughs> the ser you have sl server, you have many clients, and clients update files on the server. and Basically, the function, it could be CVS checkout, right? You can check out a file. Or CVS commit. You can commit some of the local changes that you made in the client to the server. And that's a perfect example of programming with remote procedure calls. Well, the implementation of that CVS itself. Maybe we should do that in this class. <laughs> then the class will increase in terms of its <laughs> the topics that we cover. But that's... That's essentially what's happening here. You can think of accelerated critical sections as, or BIS as a client server model, except it's done on chip without programmer support, right? You could think of this large core as a server and these uh, little processors as the clients. And automatically we're shipping the functions, which are bottlenecks, and automatically we're identifying what data is needed. Now you could program this, or expose all of this to the programmer and program it with the same model, right? The same model, your server could be executed on the large core and uh, small cores could be executing whatever is executed on your clients. But then the programmer needs to deal with it. We're making programmer not deal with the data marshaling. Okay. OK. I don't know if we have time to cover this. Maybe we should stop here. Uh, and we'll start with this next time. And then we'll go into multi-threading. Yes? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Han reminds me. I think I, I made a mistake here. This is good for you. It's a good mistake for you. <laughs> I think I mentioned, well, I corrected it now. But this was Friday before. But it's really Sunday. September 30th. September 30th is a Sunday. So you have two more days to do these reviews. Maybe we should add one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll see you on Wednesday.